and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm Sandy Mason with the University of Illinois Extension as the State Master Gardener Coordinator, and we are so glad you've decided to join us on this very blustery winter day. And of course, Mid-American Gardener is your chance to get some answers to your gardening questions. Maybe you're thinking about what you're going to grow this year. And also, you want to stay tuned because later on, we do have a scoop contributor, and Chris is going to be talking about how you can grow vegetables outdoors all year long. Amazing. So you're going to make sure you stay tuned for that. And of course, we always have a great group of people to help you out with your gardening questions and your gardening plans, and tonight is no different. And Bob, how about you? I'm glad to be here. My name is Bob Skurr, and I'm a retired professor here at the University of Illinois, where I taught for 40 years. Anyway, and one, one of the things I really like, my specialty is fruit crops, and one of the things I really like doing is going to the grocery store, and the, at the grocery store, any time of the year, they've got different stuff coming in. The, the, the season right now, one of the things you haven't seen it, there's some really nice blueberries coming in from Chile. Yes. They really aren't very expensive and they're really good. So get out and buy some blueberries. But another fruit that, that's here that maybe you've never tried is uh, what we call star, star fruit, car, car, carambola. Can you see, can you get that down here? And star fruit is this cool looking thing that looks like a, looks like a star. And w when you cut it, you actually have these little stars. And the, and the stars are really quite edible. This is a carambola can, can be pretty good. I usually like them, but they're a little more yellow than this. You can't eat them, but they're really beautiful in uh, fruit salads and in punch bowls. A lot of people will take a freeze them in that fr big chunk of ice and freeze them in that. And they're beautiful in that. And you can just play, eat them straight. Sometimes, let's see. Oh, good one. They have a little bit of seed in them. <laughs> a little bit of seeds. It's good. Yeah, it's good. I bought these at the store today. And so try a carambola. Try, try a star fruit. It, it's good. Actually, they're kind of a sweet, tart kind of thing, mm -hmm. and some people really like them, but they're, they're really probably, nice in a fruit very, salad. probably more pretty than they are. Yeah, they're more, the more best, best use for them is they're just plain <laughs> orna <laughs> ornamental. Flo <laughs> put them in your fruit salad. Float them, but you float can't them eat them if you want to. Very good, Bob. Bowl. Thanks a lot, Bob. If you like and, kumquats, you might uh, like those. Oh, if you like kumquats, you might like those. So that's good to know. Yeah, that's good a good idea, know. yeah. Good idea. Cool. And Mary Ann, thank you. Hi there, everybody, and I am Marianne Metz. I'm a horticulturalist and landscape designer, and uh, currently I'm working at Prairie Gardens, and I would like to share with you something that everybody is so anxious to do right now. This uh, increasingly cold uh, winter we're having is starting seeds indoors. Um, basic supplies is what I want to share with you, and the first thing, of course, what you need is seed starting medium, and you can, you can purchase that um, and it is actually called seed starting material, or potting material, and not expensive. But then the next thing you need are containers, all sorts of containers, plastic, peat, uh, different sizes of peat, um, even little peat pellets that you put water in and they expand. And don't forget to have markers so you can mark the plants, the you, seeds you that you forget. started. <laughs> because you'll forget. We always think oh Absolutely. <laughs> And it's absolutely really important to have these so you know what you're doing. And then, and of course, I forgot this this particular container also, which is a nice little cells of, of uh, for seeds uh, material. And of course, the most important thing, seeds, whether you're starting lovely vegetables or annuals or perennials or bright colored things or just really fun stuff to start in, the, in your indoors. But the important thing is to read the package. You want to read the back of the package. It tells you about starting it indoors, when to start it indoors, or whether it should be uh, sewn directly into your garden. And certainly do not forget a pen, which I just dropped, but it's a, a pen that you want to use as a marker so it doesn't wipe off of your plastic. And something to water with. I love sprayers because they're much more gentle when you spray the water rather than using a watering mm -hmm. Can. And there you have it. Happy seed starting. Yeah, great. And, and I think the one thing, once you get your kind of system set up and you're used to doing it, because the one thing, they really, you generally, you're always going to need supplemental light. That's probably yes, the thing. Yes, almost always. So yes. some kind of like fluorescent light, but like yeah. the shop lights or something like that. So yep. once you kind of get your system set yes. up, it's like, and I figure, you know, this time of year, it's like, it's cheaper than therapy. And yes, it is. To me, <laughs> it is therapy. It's something to look forward to. And yeah. it's something to, to do with your children to. because young kids love watching those seeds sprout and come up and um, yeah, then great. they try transfer into the garden. So it's a great way to get your kids interested in what's going on Super. in the yard. Thanks, Mary Ann, something to look forward to. Thank you very much, and John. I'm John Bodensteiner. I'm a Vermilion County Master Gardener, and I like perennials, hostas, um, trees, shrubs, 
just about anything green that grows in Illinois, I pretty much have in my yard and I enjoy. Even some things that we can't hardly grow in Illinois. And for that, I do volunteer out at the um, VA greenhouse in Danville. And so I brought today a, some, a flower from the banana. And this part is the male flower. Um, and up at the very top, you can see the baby bananas. And they may not grow quite as big as the ones at the grocery store, but um, we, we, we get, and they're, if you let them grow on the tree until they're yellow, they are just super, super delicious. These probably won't be quite as good, but still, they, they taste just wonderful. And it's something just different that you can grow. We've got all kinds of fruits and different things out there. And so I get to garden year round. It's not like I, I have awesome. like Mary Ann. <laughs> have, have John, one, one of the things that's interesting is the banana. I had a lot of foreign students and, and one of those, I had several Arabic students and they said that Arabic, that the word banana means finger. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like I about it, banana is like a finger. And then when you buy a bunch of bananas, that's called a hand of bananas because all those fingers that are in there looks like a hand. Yeah, it, look, it looks does. like a hand. Very Absolutely. Good. Very good. Wonderful so it's stuff. one of those things we talk sometimes about bananas being like tropic, you know, tropical plants that you yes. just like to grow outside. Absolutely. But to actually get the bananas themselves, then often you, you need can a do it. It's a pretty expensive process. Yeah, it's very expensive. <laughs> yeah, very expensive banana. Let's, let's yes. somebody else handle the greenhouse. Yeah, yeah. What, what, the another, cost of a greenhouse. Another nice thing you can use the leaves. I, I use the leaves oh, for absolutely. cooking, steaming yes. fish, and you know they use very that good. and. The flower arranging, yes. oh, all sorts yes. of things. Yes, absolutely. The beauty of trying something different. So yep. thank you very much, John. That's great. And of course, always thinking about doing something a little bit different. Uh, it's time to get the scoop from our pals in other parts of Illinois. And today's scoop comes from Chris Inroth. He's U of I Extension Educator in Horticulture over in Macomb in the western part of Illinois. And he's with us online too. Hi, Chris. Hello, Sandy. Thank you for having me on Mid-America Gardener. So. Yeah. While most of us, I would say, this time of year are turning to the grocery store produce section, I am still harvesting out of my garden. Yay. Amazing. And, yes. And so there, there's a very specific way I have to do this, a special thing I have to do. So to keep my plants alive, I am using low tunnels to extend the growing season into these cold months of the year. And so low tunnels are essentially mini high tunnels. And a high tunnel is also known as like a hoop house. High tunnels are large enough that you can walk into. A low tunnel is uh, a shorter structure, only spans about one or two beds, only about two to three feet high. And if you are a do-it-yourselfer, you can build your very own low tunnel, or you can order your own low tunnel kit online, and it will come with everything that you need. And I actually built my own low tunnel, and I built it by bending metal electric conduit into hoops, and then I installed those hoops over top my garden bed, and then I cover it with plastic. It's that plastic that protects our plants. So now something to keep in mind, though, I am not growing warm season crops like tomatoes and peppers or, or bananas. Uh, instead, <laughs> what we have no in the low tunnel, we have cool season vegetables, mm -hmm. and these are more adapted to our colder temperatures that we have this time of year. So the low tunnel that uh, it might be pictured on your screen, this is, is actually in our McDonough County Gift Garden. This is where our master gardeners grow food to donate to local food pantries. And our master gardeners have harvested into early December in 2017, this past year. We were digging out carrots, onions, turnips. We were cutting uh, head lettuce and spinach and kale. And we did all of this in December. And I even harvested right up to Christmas Eve. I picked some salad greens for our uh, family holiday meal. And so with our frigid temps that we have been having, um, the, several of the less cold tolerant crops have uh, essentially croaked, uh, like a lot of the lettuces and broccoli and the, the cabbage, but our spinach, carrots, and kale, those three crops are still looking great. I also have parsnips, which are holding in the ground. They've frosted, the, the top growth is frosted, but the roots are uh, still in the ground, and I just dig them up whenever I want to roast some root veggies in the winter or make a pot of chicken noodle soup. And probably fall and winter gardening is my favorite time of year to garden. The wonderful thing about it is the cold builds up sugars in the plant tissue, and this gives produce a sweeter flavor. And there's nothing better, I'd say, than winter spinach and carrots. Plus, this time of year, I don't have to worry about insects. I don't even have to worry about watering or fertilizing or weeding. I just go out and pick the plants when I need them. 
That's actually pretty darn amazing. And I know the first time I ever saw that, it was I was stunned um, that that things were still looking good in December. And then even you know in Jan, you had some pictures of them with with the the low tunnels with snow on them. Stuff that it's amazing that these plants can can tolerate these cold temperatures. But as you say, it has to be certain plants. You can't do tomatoes and some of those. But certainly you know kale and spinach and a lot of that stuff tolerates it. Brussels so sprouts. Awesome. Brussels sprouts. That's why another the best. good one. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. I think you really gave us some great ideas. Great. I know if people go to YouTube, you actually have some um, videos actually mm. on YouTube. So if people check for um, those that information on how to build low tunnels. You can see how Chris has actually built the low tunnels. And it's, mm. it's pretty inexpensive thing to do. You can put it over your raised beds and uh, it's just really pretty amazing. So thank you, Chris, so much for sharing this with us. It gives That's us something to think about even for mm -hmm. next winter. So mm. thank you very much. That's thank been great. You. Sure, thanks. I know this is one of those things that I, until you see it, you can't mm -hmm. quite believe that these plants can tolerate it's these amazing. kind of cold temperatures, but it really is amazing. So we really can have vegetables out in the garden mm -hmm. year round. And, and fruits, raspberries, I've seen raspberries in New York. They oh, grow, they, 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 York State. Yeah, they, they grow amazing. them in high, mm -hmm. high tunnels of raspberries and selling, selling fresh raspberries in New York City at Christmas, right. Christmas time. For and strawberries I've seen and stuff. Yeah. So I think probably the big thing is really these do not have, there's no heat element yeah. in there yeah. or anything. So there's no heat. Okay, very good. So something to think about. So thanks so much. And we're going to go to our callers. And we have a caller, Paul, is on line three. And you have some flowers that are turning black. And I'm guessing you probably don't want them to be turning black. <laughs> <laughs> what can we do for you, Paul? Yeah, that's correct. It's a Francis Williams hosta. And I know it's an outdoor plant, but I've kept it inside. I live in an apartment. And I'm trying to figure out what to do and what, what's wrong. So it's growing indoors in your apartment right now? So it's a hosta? Yeah. Oh, wow. I've never tried to grow them indoors. Yeah. <laughs> I actually had a friend who did some research in, in growing hosta indoors, what kind of a, a time period that they tolerated it. Uh, it was many years ago, but he got about 18 months out of it, and then mm -hmm. it just kind of dwindled. Yeah. But they're, like you said, Paul, they're not indoor plants. Um, it really does need some cold dormancy. Mm -hmm. Uh, to be a viable plant. So if you have um, an unheated garage or just some place that's very, very protected or some place that you can mulch it in hugely, I mean like mm -hmm. like 10 or 12 inches of mulch around the pot, you can get it through the winter like that. But yeah. it needs yeah, the cold. Mulch. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've heard before that they, that they like Marianne said, they'll just start to do, if you bring yes. them in, they just, they, they just they go decline. downhill. So for now, if you can't get them outside, I think I'd try to put them in a cold part. Mm -hmm. it, hopefully your apartment isn't cold, but maybe there's a cold part somebody <laughs> cold, else is cold, Maybe there's a garage part, in the apartment. Yeah. Or a garage a couple, in the apartment. Yeah, 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 that would be so good. So hopefully that helps. I'm not sure why the, the flowers themselves would be turning black unless it's, they maybe that, have a... That could have been some kind of pathogen that was yeah, brought into the house. Yeah, I wonder if they're not having yeah. a little fungal disease. Yeah, it was which probably I'd go in and cut those off. Yeah, certainly. I would, definitely. At any rate, so yeah, I may have to think about indoor plants, Paul. I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the call. And I know we have lots of information when it comes to different kinds of uh, plants, those kind of things. We certainly have that. And I think we'll just go ahead and go to our, we certainly have some lines open if people want to go ahead and give us a call. Uh, we'll certainly take those calls. But why don't we go ahead and do our emails? Okay. We have some more emails. <coughs> okay, I'm Bob Skirvin again. And uh, I have a uh, question here for somebody they didn't they put a name down that's all right anyway and they have some lemon trees they have two two lemon trees and the lemon trees they, they planted them as, as seed as seeds a long time ago five years ago and and one of them is really big and I've got a picture here they got it really big it's pushing the ceiling up against the ceiling pushing against the ceiling <laughs> there, that one over there you can't even see the top of it and then the and the uh, the other one there is, is shorter and the, anyway, there, there are two seedlings, they're growing different, and that's, that's kind of common. You can see the one over here on the, that side, I guess on our right, is branching more. And that's kind of more what you expect mm -hmm. if you had a house plant or a plant look like that. The other one is just growing straight up in the air. And like I said, <laughs> heading for the seedling. And they said they potted several times, so they want some advice and future success, and I don't know exactly what they want. But you gotta gotta fertilize. What I would do on the since we're we're not I'm not used to working with citrus trees is I would certainly get on the on the Florida site or something. I'll tell you how to fertilize trees and how to prune the trees and and so forth. And that one lemon tree that's going that way like that, what you got to do is to cut out the top and get it get it to branch. 
and where it's, it's more manageable in size and the fact that they're because they are seedlings it's just it's just like brothers brothers and sisters or brothers or cousins or something <laughs> they're, they're, they're different kind of family. and that's what's happening here they're just playing different well, they're probably probably both all right. I don't know why you want a giant. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It is, you know, it really is one of those things that, you know, they might think about, oh, it's fun to try seeds, but they might even think about it's like Meyer lemon mm -hmm. or some of those yes. that are more of a, a, a small yeah. lemon that yeah. probably works better in a, kind of an indoor. They still... They, they wouldn't cost very much. You could you, you yeah. go so to the garden center, buy, buy yeah. a baby of that. Yeah, so like the thing about Meyer lemon or one of those mm -hmm. that actually I started probably a couple of Meyer Meyer lemons. Yeah, okay. Okay. So yeah. that might yeah. be something to think about, but it's it's always fun. fun to try seeds. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Right? Like we have we used to call it garbage gardens where you just sort of plant <laughs> seeds from the apples or whatever. We have a couple of of lime and lemon trees out at the VA and we have to cut those even with all the light we get, they reach and I'm sure yeah. that that's what's doing. So we you can cut that back to about three feet and it'll branch out nicely. Absolutely, yeah. they right. do. Really and well. it's great that they look so, those plants look so healthy. Or how they do. Yes. Because a lot of times they, they get they spider mites. They have a nice yeah. site there. Yes, they do. Yeah. yeah, they look really healthy. The leaves look nice and green. They get spider mites mm -hmm. yes. and some insect issues sometimes on some of the citrus. So you're doing a good job. That's yes. for yep. sure. Absolutely. So, right. so Absolutely. And Marianne. Well, my email this evening was is about dogwoods, uh, a, a species particular. It's Cornus acusa, one of my favorites. Um, these are beautiful trees, uh, large white. Well, most people call them flowers, but they're actually bracts, the mm -hmm. white. They bloom. What I like about acusas is they bloom a little bit later than the uh, Cornus florida, which we usually go around here, which oftentimes gets hit by uh, the frost. But the question is, they, they bought this dogwood in March. In the spring, it didn't have any colored leaves, which is the correct thing to say, uh, because they are modified leaves. Uh, what should I do if that happens again in the spring? Well, um, it, it, it's a lot of things that could be happening with a cornus cusa. One is the age of the tree. If it's, if it's a really young tree, you really need new, to give it just a, a few more years. Typically, between three and five years is when they'll begin to bloom. Um, it's possible that you have it in a place where it's too much sun or too little sun. Now, they are an understory tree, which means they grow on the edge of a forested area. Uh, so they like a little bit of sun, but not too much sun and not too much shade. So th that's one of the things to bear in mind is where you place it. Uh, too much fertilizer, we make it do a lot of vegetative mm -hmm. growth, you know, a lot of leaf growth, and um, consequently no energy left for the flowering. So you don't want to put um, prepared fertilizers, especially on a young tree. If you've just planted it, I, it's just not a good idea. Um, if you did any pruning on it um, too far into the into the fall or winter, you cut off the flowers for next year. So you want to be very careful about when you prune a flowering plant. Uh, a good rule of thumb with any flowering tree or shrub is right after it's finished flowering. That way you're not cutting off the, the flowers that have been produced for the following season. Um, I, I think one of the things I'd like to suggest would be um, compost, uh, composted cow manure, your, your, your garden compost, to dre top dress around the plant. That would be a nice uh, little boost, not too strong. And the other thing that so many gardeners are so blessed with is patience. <laughs> I was just, I was just thinking that. Sometimes we, it, that's what it takes. Isn't we it? just, it just does. It just <laughs> takes, it just takes time, um, yeah. and it, it probably will take a couple of years. But the, the the compost will not hurt. Definitely, that's a nice thing to just do just for not, a newly planted deep, though, plant. Though, though. No, no, you don't want to put five inches yeah, of compost yeah. around it. Just, just top dress lightly around the tree, and and if you can dig it in, do. If you can't, without disturbing the the roots, that's that's a good uh, thing to do for the tree. They really are uh, beautiful small trees. Oh, if they you, are if just not, gorgeous. If you've never seen a the dogwood in full yeah. bloom. Mm -hmm. It's just absolutely They're stunning gorgeous. trees. So really good, good, good information and, and just good care. Sometimes yes. it's just good care and patience, right? Yes, okay, absolutely. Good. Thank you very much, Marianne. Yep. And John? Um, I have an email and they have a question about a wild American plum. Uh, it was Mike and he has a wild plum tree uh, and he's asking if you need two plants to produce pollen and yes you do. And he's wondering if he can do a cutting from one bush, will that pollinate the mother plant and produce fruit? No, because that's a clone of the original plant and you need a, a different um, family member basically to do it. And I would like to know if the wild plum bush tree will produce the plum bush from another local region. And yes, that's what you need is another another plum tree from a different neighbor or a different area. And that definitely will cross-pollinate then. So even some of your domestic plums will tend to cross-pollinate. Just like most trees, 
even those that self-pollinate, you still get better pollination okay. um, from if you have two varieties. So. Okay. okay, very good, very good. Thank you very much. And we do have some callers, and online too, we have a day from Oriana. And you have a question about planting coffee. It must be the night for tropical stuff. What's your question, Dave? Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is, I collected a bunch of coffee grounds, is what I... Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I, what I want to do is, uh, I don't know when to put this in the garden. Uh, I've got about a 45 by 40 vegetable garden, and, and I don't know you know, when to put this on. Do I wait till the spring or when? Okay, it has a bunch of coffee grounds, which are great. That's great. What do you think? Absolutely. Um, a lot of people use coffee grounds because they think it's gonna change the pH, because uh, coffee is acidic, but it's only a temporary fix. Um, they've done some studies, and after about six months, the pH goes right down to um, right. seven. Right, and but so, it's good stuff. But it's good, yeah, good it stuff. And and the best thing to do would be to, if you've got a whole bunch of it, just to put it in your compost pile. If you don't have a compost yeah. pile, just spread it out thinly and it won't be any. Yeah, 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 actually you could do that anytime. Yeah, anytime. 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 Just to put yeah. it uh, yeah. thinly. Yeah. 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 yeah, I would go ahead and do it now. And actually, you know, the worms love it. So oh, if you yeah. ever do vermiculture or doing mm -hmm. anything with worm composting, the worms absolutely love it. So I love ground. And I don't think people always think sometimes that you can actually, sometimes your local, you know, coffee shop or whatever, mm -hmm. they have so many grounds yeah. and stuff. Oh, sometimes sure. they're more than willing to have yeah. somebody come and take uh, the grounds uh, away yeah, from the them. Big they use grounds. Package, just pick them up and take them home. Yeah, yeah. So so think about that. Maybe you can make that relationship with your, you know, buy some coffee and then see if they'll give you the grounds. From great the, stuff. Thanks. Great idea, Dave. Good for you. Thanks. Thanks for letting us know about that. Now, on line three, we have Mark, and you have a question about a mat mountain ash tree. What can we do for you, Mark? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I've got two mountain ash trees that uh, I planted them approximately 20, 25 years ago, and they have had the ash bore in them for two years. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess because they're full of holes now. Mm -hmm. They uh, last fall they or this fall they died. Um, if I cut those down, do I need to burn the entire trunk and everything, or can I cut those up for firewood and put them in my log uh, log pile for outside burning, or is the larvae in there so uh, that we need to get rid of, or how do I? Okay. So are these really mountain ash? They're they're a mountain ash. Right. It was called a mountain ash when I uh, one of them I think would have been a purple ash and maybe the other one was a mountain mm. ash. They had oh, the yeah, red berries, the clumps of red berries. Yeah, because mountain ash actually doesn't get emerald ash yeah. or it get yeah. mountain ash gets a whole bunch of other problems. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as the mountain ash, what do you think? They're, they they. It, it may have gotten something else, another boar yeah, yeah. or Some something kind else. Of boar. Probably not but, the emerald <clears throat> ash. Though. Yeah, I, probably not emerald ash. Boar, right now, the state of Illinois has kind of right. given up on the, the emerald, trying to keep <laughs> the emerald ash boar yeah. out. So, yeah, you could cut it up and burn it. I would burn it as soon as I could so that, you know, in case your neighbor has got an ash tree, they're trying to, you know, they've, they're spraying it and keeping it and, you know, get rid of it as, as soon as possible yeah, but yeah and, and unfortunately mountain ash really are one of those trees that are really tough to grow around it, here. it really they yeah. really are anyway, and they're, they're beautiful but yes yep. they are and then we have a caller online for cindy and from the Nara, you have a question about amaryllis cindy online yeah four. i Hi. have a couple amaryllis that have started to send up flower stalks from the bulb and then they just stop oh. and i can't ever get them to come out of the bulb and i'm afraid to Keep on watering them. Hmm. So it sends yeah. up the flower stalk and then nothing, huh? Hmm. Yeah. A flower stalk with no flower buds on it? Does it get Well, does it get the, the plant just starts to, to peek out of the bulb and then it just So it might there. just be the leaves coming out. It's, it sounds like it's just the leaves yeah. and not actually a flower scape. Because the, the bulb would have a, a, a rounded edge on yeah. the top. and. Yeah, you just may, just may, again maybe pay patience. So and then certainly making sure that you, you water it, mm -hmm. uh, and they need they really like a lot of light. Yeah, at that they like once a they, very, so a make lot sure they have plenty of light. Those kind of things. And, and don't stop water. Okay, great. And uh, and Mary Ann, do you have a quick question for us on line five about trimming trees? Yeah, hibiscus. I have a hibiscus plant. I have to keep it outside in the winter because I don't have any place 
it's a twisted bark tree like oh sure and i want to know if i when i should trim it back uh so it can grow uh you know the new leaves next okay. summer okay very good thank you marianne uh trimming hibiscus what do you think she said she kept it outside it's probably, it, it probably is it did. outside <laughs> yes uh, if it's the tropical one, it's you're not going to have to worry about trimming it because it's dead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, unfortunately, but the tropical one. If it one, freezes, it's done. Yeah. One thing I'd like. At to any rate, so so yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, the tropical one. I think with the hibiscus, that's going to be a real issue it's gone. for you. So sorry about that. Unless it's one of the shrub types. Yeah. Um, that would be outdoors. So sorry about that. So anyway, thank you all very much. And remember, you can always connect with us on Facebook and email. Also check out your local Levi Extension office and check out the Master Gardener program. They may be able to help you with some of your plans or you might want to get involved with that as well. So this is that perfect time to be getting out garden catalogs, thinking about what you're going to plant this year. We gave you some great ideas. So thank you all very much. And I hope you'll join us again next time on Mid-American Gardener.